Welcome to the Sensible Socialist Podcast, a podcast for the rational left. We need to unite and work together if we're all going to get through this. Sounds like socialism to me. The amount of people I see talking about socialism positively is actually staggering. Do you think, we, I mean, do you really think that, we, that a, a proletarian revolution is just around the corner in America? Grab your pitchforks and stab your mayor. Little hero Obama. He's not my hero. How heroic he does Trump. Trump. <laughs> If Bernie Sanders were president, right, and he wanted to bring the same ideas as social, for socialism into this country, don't, do you think that would be a benefit? I just told you Venezuela is eating rats. But I just want people to have health care. I don't want, like... <laughs> well, Same thing Hugo Chavez. Oh my god. You people know. have, like, worms in your brain, honestly. So welcome to an episode, another episode of the Sensible Socialist Podcast. I'm the host, Kevin Gustafson. And with me today for, uh, I think, what will be a very interesting discussion is Graham Priest. Uh, Graham is a distinguished professor of philosophy at the CUNY Graduate Center in New York. Uh, originally from South London, Graham moved to Australia to take a position at the University of Western Australia and then stayed in Australia until he came to CUNY in 2009. Graham's primary focus is in logic, like formal logic, and has explored the logical implications of things like paraconsistency and dialetheism, uh, and obviously the role of contradictions. Uh, so for those well-versed in either sort of Buddhist or Marxist ideas, contradiction plays a fairly significant role in the underlying logic of each of these systems. Uh, and while there's this background in formal logic, uh, Graham's 2021 book, Capitalism, Its Nature and Replacement, Buddhist and Marxist insights, uh, attempts to make linkages between these two philosophical traditions, but fear not, it doesn't contain any formal logic. Um, so it may be a surprise to Buddhist and Marxist alike that there is a connection between these two schools of thought. Uh, however, there's famous Buddhists like the current Dalai Lama, who consider themselves Marxists, and famous Marxists like B.R. Ambedkar, who were also Buddhists. So in the last year or so, uh, I've taken time away from this podcast and other projects to do my own sort of investigation into Buddhism and its ideas and the practice. And so in sort of doing so, uh, I've come across Graham's writings on the subject. And so I wanted to come back to this podcast for this topic uh, specifically. So Graham, thanks for uh, coming on the podcast and kind of being the first one to restart it after a bit of a hiatus. My pleasure, Kevin. <laughs> So um, I don't know if there's any, um, maybe I would be curious just as a way of starting out um, to get a little bit of a background before we get into like the, the meat of the thing, just to understand a bit of how you became interested in Buddhist ideas or even Eastern philosophy coming, you know, logic seems to me to be like, you know, the analytical philosophy par excellence. Um, and uh, so obviously there's a whole question as to whether or not there is a real distinction between analytical and continental philosophy or even Eastern and Western philosophy. We've talked about that on this podcast, but um, I'm curious just how you got into uh, thinking about, you know, ideas in Eastern that come from, say, Eastern philosophy. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's relatively straightforward. Um, maybe the most straightforward thing I'm going to raise. <laughs> um, I started life uh, my academic life, I was a mathematician. Okay, I did my doctorate in mathematics. But um, after I did that, I, by the time I'd finished that, I realized I wanted to be a philosopher, not a, math not a mathematician. Uh, and luckily, I was offered a job in a philosophy department, and I've worked in philosophy departments ever since. So, because of that, when I started my um, professional life, I actually didn't know much philosophy. Um, and I had to teach myself, which I, I did. And uh, working in an Anglo context, which I always have done most of the time. Well, yeah, I always have done, really. Um, there wasn't much knowledge of or reference to or uh, recognition of the Asian traditions. And yeah. so the, all the philosophy I learned and taught myself was Western. But in the 90s, I had the good fortune to meet um, someone who's now a very old friend, Jay Garfield, uh, who knew a lot more about the Asian traditions and still does. Um, and talking to him showed me that 
uh, I was missing half the world's philosophy. <laughs> so I made a point of trying to teach myself some of that too, which I've been doing ever since. And I haven't given up the Western canon, you know, far from it. Uh, I regard both canons as important. And if you're dealing with any problem, I think both, that they're interesting, important things to be learned from both canons. Yeah, which is why I think it's interesting that you that you know in some ways you th- there's more connections than I think most people will often discuss or that that a lot of credit is given to. It does there is this like major bifurcation in between even analytical and continental philosophy and then certainly Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy. But when you do get into the kind of the actual details and some of the thought processes, there's obviously been uh, there's either some deep truths that have been kind of discovered in, uh, by different people in different places, or there's been a kind of cross-pollination of ideas that they're, they're not as far apart as one might initially think. Indeed. I mean, we'll never know what was going across the Silk Route in, right. um, you know, the first, the, the, the last millennium of the, of, uh, before uh, the Common Era, or at least it, of the first 500 years of the Common Era. Um, it would be surprising if things weren't going across. But l- l- set that aside. I mean, th- th- there are some perennial philosophical problems, such as what is the nature of reality? How should I live? Uh, how do you know these things? Um, and because they're perennial problems, they occur to people in every culture, and people in every culture worry, think about these things, and, and come up with possible answers. Uh, and sometimes the answers they come up with are, are similar in different places, and sometimes they're kind of different in different places. Um, but understanding the answers to these problems that have come up uh, in different at uh, different places and times helps you to understand the problems much better. And maybe find solutions Maybe not, but it, it certainly enriches the problem. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I mean, in some ways, when you look at that too, you that, that does, in my mind at least, give some credence to that, to like the sort of basic Marxist principle that to, to understand the thoughts that come out of places, you have to understand the kind of material conditions that they live in. And so you see these like threads that run through because we're all human beings living in societies and having those kinds of problems. But then there's these like things that you can see that are different really based on you know, where they, people are and what systems they're sort of living in. And so that either constrains or expands it, which becomes an own, its own kind of interesting uh, thing to investigate in terms of the kind of anthropological aspect of what is what is living in certain structures do to the thought processes that people come to, given the fact that we all are generally dealing with the same kinds of questions and issues. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's certainly true. I mean, people's uh, thinking is going to be influenced by their social and economic conditions. Um, but, you know, o- often there's a sort of commonality of social and economic conditions. Um, uh, for example, if you look at the flourishing of, of philosophy in uh, India and Greece and China, and it happens around the same time, about the sort of 5th century BCE, um, it's pursued by people who have the time to think about it right. uh, and maybe write about it. Uh, and so they've, there's got to be, you know, in Marxian terms, uh, a class of people who, who can live off the um, the things produced by other people to give them time to do philosophy. Yeah. That's what Aristotle said, right? You, you didn't have any philosophy until you had someone else who could make your bread. Yeah, that that's, you know, putting it basically, but that's correct. <laughs> um, all right, so I want to... Um, I want to get into to the the book, you know, capitalism, uh, its nature and, and replacement. Um, so your your book does a really good job of sort of reviewing the basic elements of Marxist, Buddhist, and, and anarchist thought. And I think we can take for granted that the audience of the Sensible Socialist podcast has a background uh, and is fairly familiar with sort of Marxist ideas and to a lesser degree anarchist ones, but probably not too much on Buddhist philosophy in general. So. Um, it's a, I know it's a big sort of task, but can you give us at least a brief overview of the sort of basic philosophy of Buddhism? What is it about and what does it sort of say? Sure. Okay. So the first thing to understand is that Buddhism is a tradition of thought, which is two and a half thousand years old, and it's moved um, in, in continents or subcontinents. Well, I mean, it's, it's now moving into the West, so it's moved through continents and of course it's evolved in two and a half thousand years 
So there's going to be a lot of disagreement about things, even amongst Buddhists. Uh, uh, and um, so I can't say all Buddhists, all Buddhists believe this or that or the other, because that ain't going to be true. Um, however, there's a kind of certain commonality. Um, no one really, no Buddhist is going to deny the original thoughts of the Buddha, you know, Siddhartha, um, which sort of define where it all started. And um, the, the original teaching of the of the Buddha, we don't know his dates, but maybe around the fifth century BCE, um, was the thought that life is characterized by, and then there's this kind of Sanskrit or Pali word, which is hard to translate into English. Is that is it is dukkha. Um, the standard translation is suffering, but the resonances are much broader than that. Um, the thought is that in everybody's life, things happen they don't like. Everybody gets old. Everybody gets ill. You know, everybody goes through um, unhappy life experiences, relationship breakups, losing jobs, not getting what you like happiness coming to an end you know all, all these things that, that, that that's true and, and one of the basic posits of buddhism is that this happens to everyone and you know that's an empirical observation and it's pretty accurate you know mm -hmm. everyone gets old and infirm sooner or later if they're lucky enough to live to you know to a ripe old age um and, that, and no one likes that okay um but the Buddha said, well, look, there, there is a cause of this. Uh, you don't have a lot of effect on many things that happen to you in life. Um, you can t look after yourself and try and stop yourself getting ill, but in the end, whether or not you get ill is often largely beyond your control. So um, you don't have a lot of control over a lot of the things that cause you to do. But the one thing you do have control over is your headspace. Mm. Uh, So maybe the most robust way of mitigating this experience of dukkha is is changing our attitude towards things. So um, when something happens we don't like, it, that the, the the dissatisfaction is caused by the attitude we bring to bear on this. And of course, when something happens we really like, then we really like it because of the attitude we bring to bear on it. So um, the Buddha's thought was, well. You, you've got to change the way you think about the things that happen to you in life um, and not be so, um, don't let yourself be so uh, drawn by uh, attachment, um, you know, uh, really being attached to things, hating them, loving them, this kind of thing. So that's, I mean, that's the sort of potted summary of something that's called the first um, two or three noble truths. Uh, uh, and most people who are Buddhists will agree on this. Now, let me say two things which are relevant, particularly relevant in this context. The first is that uh, that can make it sound a very sort of self-centered thing in a certain sense. Namely, uh, you want to get rid of your own dukkha, okay? But compassion has always been a central element of Buddhism. And in fact, it's promoted into the major virtue in Buddhism in in, in later Mahayana Buddhism. So uh, it's not just about getting rid of your own suffering, but it's about getting rid of other people. So you should be concerned. I mean, shit happens for everybody, and you should be concerned with the shit that happens to other people, not just yourself. In fact, these two are deeply connected in some way, because we're all integrated uh, in a way that I think no, no Marxist needs to be told with other people in the society in which we live. Okay, so that's the first observation. The second observation is you may think that the Buddhist teachings are simply uh, get rid of suffering, change your headspace, don't worry about anything else. Okay, in particular, don't worry about the material conditions that cause suffering as well. And that would be wrong as well, because uh, suffering is bad. That's a kind of an axiom of Buddhism. Um, and if it's bad, you should be trying to get rid of the cause and maybe the most robust cause in the long run is getting is in your head but um the other causes are equally bad and you should there's just exactly the same kind of rationale to get rid of those 
And indeed, you can't do a lot of the things to help you change your attitude if the material conditions are not right. So, for example, how, how can you do things like um, uh, do the kind of meditative practices that Buddhism requires uh, if you're worrying about where your next meal is coming from, whether your kids are starving, if you're in a war zone, uh, if, you know, um, every night you work 10 hours, or every day you work 10 hours a day, and when you come home from work, you're knackered, okay? So um, the material conditions are really important. Now, traditional philosophy, traditional Buddhist, Buddhist philosophy, hasn't paid a lot of it attention to these conditions but in the last day well the last century or so we have seen philosophers like the, the Dalai Lama the current Dalai Lama Tishna Han and Ambedekar you know, who you mentioned just now uh, take these Buddhist lessons to heart and say well if you really are concerned with people's suffering and eliminating it or at least mitigating it as you should be if you're a Buddhist because of the the importance of compassion, then you should be equally concerned with the material conditions as well as the kind of conditions that are in your head. Okay, so sorry, that's a bit longer than I wanted, but uh, hopefully that tells you something about some of the basic ideas and maybe a couple of misconceptions that you might have had, one might have had. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that in some ways that, that <clears throat> has often been one of the distinctions that I sort of see between Stoicism and Buddhism, where Stoicism does seem very much about how you deal with the world and with your own situation and stuff like that. It isn't doesn't have as clear a path towards um, uh, you know making social change or something like that. Though it doesn't seem to be prohibited by it. Whereas Buddhism, I mean, especially when you get into like the Eightfold Path, like yes, certainly that's a that's a thing that like you're supposed to do, but there's things like, you know, right speech being, thing, you know, speaking the truth, but only when useful, right? Which is to keep keeping in mind the fact that you're having an impact on someone else and someone you don't want to be the cause of suffering for someone else. And so there's these, there's this inherent or kind of built in notion that it's, it really isn't purely a self-indulgent enterprise, that it is, it has at least some kind of component. I mean, when we'll talk about it too, there is also a focus on a community. So like this, the, the, the practice of Buddhism is not supposed to be a lonely, individual, ascetic kind of practice. It's supposed to be one in which you do in a community to help either, you know, the community of either practicers or just even the larger community in general. Um, and so it seems, you know, that's one thing that's been, it, that was attractive to me um, about Buddhism, just from the background of being in many ways, hyper focused on uh, changing the material conditions and focusing on the material conditions and recognizing that that hyper focus uh, and attachment to it in some ways was causing me suffering. And so you have this dual ability to address the suffering that you experience while not having to say no to the rest of the world, but you can still participate in, uh, you know, you can be. I think a, a Buddhist and a socialist without there being a huge amount of contradiction, uh, so long as you understand both philosophies sufficiently. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 then that they needn't necessarily agree on all things, um, but there are points of commonality. Um, and, and one of the points of commonality is, um, you know, one thing that Marx emphasizes is that we're all interdependent with each other in the societies in which we live. I mean, no, no person is an island. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have this kind of social independence in other people. And one of the things that has always been a central element of Buddhist metaphysics is that the interdependence of ourselves goes a lot further than just other people. But we're interdependent with all kinds of things in our community and indeed the natural world. You know, And, and Marx is aware of that too. But in a time when our effect, the social effects on the environment is really bringing into prominence the interdependence that we have on the natural world, um, then uh, the, the Buddhist perspective is, is, is really important, I think. So um, Buddhism emphasizes the interdependence of all things, at least all things um, 
okay, there, there's a, a, a Buddhist dispute here, but I won't, which I won't go into. But let's just say all things for the moment, okay? Sure. Um, so the kind of social interdependence that Marxism clearly recognises is kind of elevated to a sort of much bigger metaphysical principle of sort of universal interdependence of all things uh, in, in the Buddhist tradition. I mean, and also in the Buddhist tradition, the, you know, the sort of two eyes that I always remember about Buddhism is interdependence and indeterminacy, which I think is also a principle that, you know, Marx brings about, especially in the idea that, you know, that there's no kind of um, fixed human structure or something like that, and all systems fade or decay or, or at least in, in the parlance would express their internal contradictions in a way that they no longer are no longer stable and, and lead to a, a, a new kind of thing. And so in terms of that, yeah, that interdependence and indeterminacy, both Marxism and Buddhism are in many ways speaking the same language, maybe just, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, impermanence is a feature of both philosophies. Um, so Marx takes that over from Hegel, and of course it's always been there in Buddhism. And uh, indeterminacy, I, I, I'm not sure that's quite the right word. Um, um, perhaps better is, um, well, let's steer clear of Buddhist jargon. The important point is that what you are depends on not depends on your relationship with the things which with with which you're interdependent mm. so the very person that you are depends on things like well your genetic code for start but also the society in which you grew up um the the, the kind of economic condition under which you live they, they make you make you partly what you are and of course no buddhist is no no marxist is going to disagree with that so um they have that in common too. The fact that um, the, the the relations that you bear to other things, uh, and uh, for Marxists, that's you know the, the, your social conditions are really important. Determine what you are, who you are, uh, how you function. Uh, so again, the, your point is right that that's a thought that you find in both philosophical traditions. So, uh, one of the you had mentioned already the the difficulty of translating the Pali word of dukkha. Uh, you know, it's often the kind of easy way is to is to do suffering. I've also heard unsatisfactoriness, even you know, a sort of straight. Um, if you're coming in from sort of Sanskrit, uh, you, you might just be like pain, right? Um, but for me, I think again, coming from this background of uh, you know, being sort of trained and, and highly focused in Marxist thought is um, the thing that it recognized to me in some ways or, or was part of it was the idea of alienation, this very important idea that comes from, you know, comes from Hegel, to sort of he through Hegel into Marx and, and that how central it is. It seems like, I don't know if it would be a legitimate translation of Dukkha to be alienation, but that does seem to fit uh, with this, you know, the even unsatisfactoriness or or suffering, this this feeling of alienation, of of being sort of disconnected and and unable to either like sort of be who you really want to be or be connected to the things that you're doing or the people that you're around in like a true and deeply meaningful way. Um, would it, it has been at least for me, I think, uh, in terms of my work life and things like that, been a major source of sort of suffering and and something that's that just sort of continues and so um i'm wondering kind of your perspective on whether or not you know you can you can talk about dukkha as alienation yeah look um marx discusses alienation mainly in the early manuscript the paris manuscripts of 1848 um and it it plays a number of roles even in the paris manuscripts but certainly one role that it plays is um, the, the feeling that life is not what it should be and you feel alienated from your labour, uh, from other people, etc., etc. Uh, and that certainly is a form of dukkha, no doubt about that. It's an unpleasant experience. Um, I think that we must... I, I don't think it, it, it's that all forms of unhappiness are caused by alienation. Um, 
So, for example, um, you know, some people, when they get old, suffer horrible illnesses like cancer uh, and Alzheimer's disease and so on, which, of course, make them and other people very unhappy. Um, that's dukkha too. Uh, I don't think that's really alienation. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think maybe something we've come to understand now more than Marx did is that there are other forms of alienation, forms other than class alienation, because um, something we've learned is that you can be alienated in your social context because of your gender or your race. Um, and if you read a number of sort of feminist writers or transgender writers, or uh, people who write on the policy of race, you'll see that they describe the same kind of alienation in their social context that Marx describes in the Paris manuscripts with respect to labor. Uh, so I think e even alienation has to be broader than class alienation. So the, uh, the, you mentioned too that, that the sort of second noble truth uh, of the Four Noble Truths is that the cause of suffering is attachment. Um, and so, um, that in some ways, I think, especially when it, the idea of you know, dukkha as alienation, it provides a limitation because I don't know, I guess in my own personal context, I have been highly attached, I think specifically to like my alienation at the different jobs I've had or the, the, a feeling sort of like a bit of an outcast or something, uh, because of the things that I believe or the things that I'm doing. Uh, and the the sort of revelation, or I guess for me, of of really studying Buddhism and 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 understanding it is that I was suffering because like that like I wasn't in some ways able to accept it, and so I was so attached to it that it caused me greater suffering than it needed to. Uh, and so I, I guess I'm curious about like how you think about this you know, this noble truth idea in Buddhism that the the sort of cause of deep suffering is attachments to, like an attachment to things or people or, or in some ways the things that actually cause us to suffer, or at least the thought processes that come from the act of being alienated or sick or something like that. You know, there's, all, there's like a whole, the whole psychosomatic aspect of becoming ill you know if you, it's like if you really don't like to throw up and you throw up the the sort of feelings that you get outside of the pure physicality of it you know the emotional consequences thereof will make you more sick in some ways and so i'm curious i guess your perspective on attachment and its its relationship to suffering yeah well, as you say, the second noble truth is that this is uh, the major causes of the experience of dukkha. Um, that when stuff happens you don't like, um, uh, that maybe that's bad enough, but your attitude can make it worse. So a sort of traditional Buddhist example is um, is anger. Okay, so if something happens you don't like, maybe you get fired. Um, maybe you see things in the world concerning the way that various classes of people are treated, you know, because of their race or whatever. Uh, and this is a bad thing, and uh, bad things should be gotten rid of. Um, but often people get angry about this. That was my experience. <laughs> um, that doesn't make it any better. Right. Okay. In fact, it just makes it worse for you because it doesn't get rid of the bad things. But now you, you're adding on this, this level of um, your own dukkha. Um, and that's kind of not very bright, if you think about it. Um, of course, this doesn't mean that you simply accept the things that cause, that you think are bad. Um, and you should be working to get rid of them. But doing so with an angry attitude uh, is uh, just adding sort of suffering on suffering, as it were. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's so. That, that that's one of the experiences I've had, having been involved in many sort of radical groups and different parties and things like that. Is is 
it's, there, there's many reasons why there hasn't been a, let's say, a, um, a revolution already, given the state of things and the, you know, wh- whether it be World War One or ecological disaster right now or something like that. And and part of it is is, um, you know, state repression and things like that, which have definitely happened in terms of in, with socialists and anarchists. But another part of it is is that even when you go back to like the founding of the International Working Men's Association. The kind of way in which socialists in general have interacted with one another has very rarely been hyper positive. <laughs> you know, you read much of like Lenin's work is all just, um, you know, ra- railing against other people and and very 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 negative. Like it's all really really negative. There's there's a whole kind of tradition where there is even this like apprehension to say, oh, this is what we're for. It's always what we're against and and always with this kind of deep anger. And I, I remember reading, it was like Confessions confessions of a Marxist Buddhist where they were signing about some, I think it was apartheid or something. And they were saying with, with solidarity and love they had. And then somebody wrote in big, like bold letters and anger, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. the same kind of thing that it just, and when you get involved in these organizations, rather than even making you feel better as a kind of individual because you're involved in a group that you think is doing, you know, what is, you know, in some ways the most important work, you can end up becoming highly, I don't even know what the right word is, just it like can screw you up, you know, and you're just around a lot of people who are angry all the time. And it, and it doesn't, it actually hinders the ability to move forward and to recruit new people and to, present a, a sort of ideas and image to the world that you are trying to proactively do something good. And I think most people are coming to it with good intentions, but it ends up in this kind of feedback loop of just like anger and frustration. And, and then it, and then it can, and we've seen often that it gets pointed at not necessarily the structures that everyone opposes, but at each other and serves to splits and, and just this kind of, constant vitriol that is really personally to like each individual a major cause of suffering and it's like you just find this group of people who are all suffering and they all kind of ramp up each other's suffering because they all agree that things are so bad yeah i mean you can't deny that in the history of the sort of um, socialist movement uh there have been major rifts um uh, the the sort of dissolution of the first international is the obvious example of that between the marxists and the anarchists um and it's because um bluntly ego gets involved yeah and Marx, quite a big ego in fact um, and bakunin too another guy with a yeah, big ego um no doubt um but uh i mean there, there's something counterproductive about ego um not only for yourself but also um in its effect on other people, as you've you've said. So, um, if you value yourself, your own ego, then it's going to make you less happy. But it's also going to get in the way of genuine communal, um, collegial action, because it, it's going to end in fights and arguments. So it's going to be make your actions ineffective. Um, so I think what you say is absolutely right. So, um, getting to another uh, sort of linkage that is, I would say, sort of deeply philosophical. You, you talk about in the book the the commonality in in terms of the notion of personhood, or so you know, of, of the idea of what it is to be a person between Buddhism and um, and Marxism. So, I want I'm curious to hear your the the linkages between the sort of the selfless, you know, the antaman, or and then the species being the God. Gattung's Weissen? Is that Gattung's Weissen? Gattung's Weissen. Yeah, Gattung's Weissen, right, sure, yeah, proper German pronunciation. So, so I'm cute, you know, uh, for the, those, I think, again, we probably have a decent idea to a certain degree what species being is, but obviously that's been a term that I think there's been a lot of sort of disagreement or misunderstanding about. So I'm curious how you see that and what the connection is between Buddhist ideas of personhood and the self or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, if you have a superficial grasp of Marxism or Buddhism, you may think that how they um, 
conceptualize the self uh, are radically different, but that's actually not true. Let's start with um, the Buddhist view. Okay, so Buddhism has this view called anatman, no self. Um, what do they mean by that? Well, the word self is kind of ambiguous. Um, the sense in which Buddhists deny it, the self is not that they think there are no persons. There are, okay. They have a certain kind of existence, but the Buddhists don't deny there are people, okay. Um, what they do deny is that they have this kind of core, this um, constant part which makes them what they are and defines them. So the thing which is there all the time, which makes you, you, um, you know, it's like when you wake up in the morning, the little voice goes on in the back of your head, hello, back again, it's me. That, it's this kind of thing. Um, so what, what, what Buddhists deny is that there is kind of, that, that people have this part which is constant and defines them as them. Uh, what defines them as them is essentially all the relations they have to other things. We've talked briefly about this. So um, the, the enactment view is a denial of self in this sense, not a denial of persons. Okay, let's come to Marx now. What's the analogue of a self in Western thinking? It's the soul. Okay, and of course I, I'm pretty sure that Marx thought that people didn't have souls. All right, so Buddhist philosophy and Marxist philosophy are going to be on the same page here. All right, um, so we've talked a little bit about what a Buddhist thinks a person is. They're, they're defined by these relationships they bear to their environment, to other people, and so on. Um, and generally speaking, the causal processes into which people enter, people and their mental attitudes and their physical parts and so on. I mean, uh, there, there's no essential you, so in a sense you are um, a series of sort of, you're a sort of work in progress uh, where you at any one time does things which cause you at the later time and so on. So uh, you, you are this sequence of constantly changing uh, things in, in this causal relationship. Okay, now let's come back to Marx. Um, so at least in his early life, um, the, the 1848 manuscripts, he talks about Gattensweis and species being, um, and it, this sort of drops out of the later Marxist writings, uh, and some philosophers have argued that he gives up the view. I, I don't think that's true, but it, it's certainly there in the early writings. So what is Gattensweis? Well, Gattensweis is sort of your species being, that's what it means literally. Um, and it's the things you have in virtue of belonging to the species you do, that is being human, okay. And what are those things? Well, if you think about it, I mean, what, what constitutes your species life? Well, it's partly biological. I mean, you gotta eat, you gotta have shelter, you gotta have clothing. Um, and it's very much social too. Uh, who you are depends on, you know, the society in which you live, the economic production that goes on there, your relationship with other people, and so on. So Marx is quite clear that, that people in their Gaffin's ways have both these biological and their social aspects. Okay, well, look, um, that's perfectly compatible with the Buddhist thought that you are an entity of some kind who, who's... Uh, and to be that entity is because you are the entity you are because of all the causal relations you enter interact to with by both your environment and other people. So uh, undoubtedly, you know, Buddhists and Marxists put different emphasis on the relevant causal interactions. But in in the end, that those the, the fact that you're embedded in this these social and um, non-social causal relationships it, it is common to both views and you may well think that they, they although they put emphasis on different things 
they're really just emphasizing different parts of the same important truth. Yeah, I think that's uh, both of them have this process oriented idea, right? That like a human being is really a process of interactions, in their interdependence coming to the sort of, uh, I think, especially in, in the Marxist sort of dialectical way of thinking about it. I mean, even each person engages in this dialectical process where th your thoughts change, your your positions change, your relationships change. Some of them, you know, might be longstanding, but there are always parts of it that, that come. And I think, I can't remember who it was exactly. Um, it might have been Thich Nhat Hanh who was asked, you know, somebody, just give me like the very quick like definition of Buddhism, like what is it really about? And he kind of sat there for a second and just said, "Things change, you know." Mm. And, I, and I think that that's you know, the, there's there's that even when it comes to understanding what it is to be human or how it is like what it is to live, it, it's this recognition that things change and that things will alter. And to be able to, I think, in, Buddhism provides a way of sort of dealing with that change on a personal level and. I think Marx's ideas are kind of uh, at maybe the collective level. And that that's maybe, I think that's often seen as the kind of incongruency. And you mentioned that, you know, sort of at the beginning of the conversation, but there does seem to be this, a big difference between the two in the fact that Buddhism does seem to be focused on a kind of, pers the endeavor of self-perfection or self-overcoming liberation. And Marxism is this like collective effort to understand and overcome uh a system. And so th there is a sense you could take the idea that that sort of self-help mantra that you can't fix the world unless you fix yourself. Um, but I mean, you've already sort of stated that you don't think that that's actually um, the point of, you know, or like part of the idea of, of Buddhism. But I, I guess I would maybe flip that around and say, you know, does Marxism have a lot to say about you know, the individual. It does seem to be very, obviously very focused on class. Uh, and and even there's been, I think, some Marxists who will try to, in some ways, deny even the influence of individual decision-making in history and things like that. Um, and so, uh, tease out this maybe potential contradiction in the sense that um, there is this, I don't know, uh, divergence in that where one is really yeah. focused on class and and these like larger structures and one is focused on the individual primarily maybe the the sangha or the sort of community of practitioners but maybe not um all that interested in understanding the systems that the systems of you know political social cultural institutions in which we live because i mean buddhism can exist you know it does exist in all probably all geographic locations, climates, uh, you know, I don't think there's a huge difference in a lot of social and political and economic institutions nowadays, but even in, where where those diverge, it seems to be compatible with those. So maybe it's less problematic or less uh, abrasive towards sort of systems, whereas Marxism is quite critical of, you know, uh, at least the capitalist mode of production. Yeah, okay. So look, first um, look, it's certainly true that um, Marxism has said most about um, the kind of social, our social lives, um, and Buddhism has said more about your personal life. That that's certainly historically true. Um, uh, at least until the twentieth century, I guess, because um, what you get in the twentieth century is. On the Buddhist side, philosophers like Thich Nhat Hanh and the Dalai Lama, who have started to emphasize the social side of Buddhism. And, you know, on the other side of the ledger, uh, there are plenty of philosophers in the in the 20th century who have been Marxists and sort of sense the, the fact that there's a lacuna in the Marxist picture about um, the personal. So, I mean, it, it's very common, or has been common in Europe, for example, to try to tie Marxism with psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, that that's not to say that I, I think this is a good conjunction. I don't, but um, th there's a sense in which um, the the fact that each tradition, as it were, has concentrated on one side of the 
situation, social or personal, um, to the, and that's forgotten the other. Uh, uh, that that I think that's happened, and that that's that's felt. So, I, I think it's true that um, the social is important, but also the personal is important. And in fact, in the last analysis, you cannot disentangle these two things. Um, you know, as Mark says, um, uh, okay, it's one of the later writing that I forget which one. Um, people make history, real life flesh and blood people, and it's their actions that make history, right? But the conditions under which they choose to make history, uh, they don't have a choice over. Those are given by their social economic context. So uh, you've got to take into account people and their actions as well as the kind of, um, the, sort of the more, shall we just say, objective things, the social and economic context. And, uh, you know, people affect the society in which they live. That's clear. You know, what Marx did affected the society in which you lived enormously, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and, of course, the society in which you live affects people. Um, there, there's this nice slogan from the feminist movement in... Um, in the 60s and 70s, that the personal is the political. Now, they didn't mean quite what I mean by it, but there's this kind of dialectical interaction between the social and the personal. And uh, if you kind of only worry about one side, then uh, you, you don't really understand the context and the situation you're dealing with. And I think you, you have to understand both. You have to understand society, its nature, its causes, and you have to understand people, their nature, their causes, and the interaction between those two things. Otherwise, you've only got one one side of the picture, as it were. Yeah, I mean, that's where, to me, there is this even sort of personal desire to really synthesize these two in particular pr traditions, the sort of you know, I'd say anarcho-Marxist tradition and the, and the Buddhist, because I do there, there just seems to be such a nice threading that they can do where you can, you know, you, I've again, met a lot of Marxist and anarchists who quite obviously do not take care of themselves uh, in, in both even just like physically, but emotionally. Uh, and that though they might have a lot of really good and useful ideas about the current structure and how to change it or what needs to change or, and all this kind of stuff, they're the, the fact that they're not focusing on the, their, their own personal well-being uh, diminishes the 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 returns that that can come from it, and and then vice versa. You know, the, to yeah. not weave these things together just produces a bunch of people who have really good ideas and a really good motivation to change society, who are a lot of times terrible human beings. And you might have a lot of people who are really good human beings, but are not in some ways sufficiently focused on how they can, you know, um, how they can propel that into a larger sort of zeitgeist or, or a sort of, uh, you know, general social milieu that will have reverberating effects for, for other cool. people. Yeah, both are important. Uh, I mean, let me give you a couple of analogies. The first is, suppose you're really ill or maybe you've been knocked down by a car or something and you, you go into hospital and the surgeon is operating on you. You don't want your, your surgeon to be... Uh, hungry and starving. You don't want your surgeon to be angry. You, I mean, you don't want him to feel your pain. You want him to get rid of your pain. I mean, so um, you you want the surgeon to be functioning as a good person, as a good surgeon, so that they can help you, right? So that that that, that the surgeon that looks after themselves is something that you want um, to, to to help you. Um, and you know, you can sort of extrapolate this to. Um, people and societies in which they live but, but then of course um, if you get the society screwed up then it's not going to produce happy people and take you know any of the unpleasant societies in the world well um, let's say unfortunate society as well so the you know the, the current people who are starving in Eritrea um, uh, clearly the social conditions are having an enormous impact on their happiness and their well-being so uh, you want you know, the, the personal and the social or political 
to dovetail, um, I mean, look, at root, both Marxism and Buddhism have this much in common. We live in a world, social, natural world, which is deeply problematic. Uh, um, and looking around the world nowadays, it really is deeply problematic, perhaps more than it's ever been before. But uh, we want to make it better. To make it better, you have to understand the causes. The causes are partly social, partly personal, and partly to do with the relationship between them. Uh, but if you want to make it better, you've got to understand the causes first. Otherwise, you know, your actions are going to be wrong or counterproductive. Um, but you can both Buddhism and Marxism have this thought that the world is screwed up. We want to, and we can make it a better place. We've got to understand how it works, and then we can act in such a way as to improve it. And that that is true of both Buddhism and Marxism. Absolutely. Um, sort of quickly, I'm curious, how do you see the the role of the the Sangha in Buddhism? Um, you know, is the, the Sangha like a small group of practitioners who practice together? Can it be expanded towards even sort of non-practitioners, but just like the community in general? I, I've seen, especially people who I think are maybe coming from a, a Marxist sense to uh, are like they want to expand the circle of the Sangha in some ways to incorporate maybe everyone. And so there, because there is this focus in Buddhism on the sort of importance of the, the community and the role that, you know, the individual needs to sort of ha have a vision towards the community. And so if you're, if you're kind of wanting to make that society wide, you expand the circle, not just to like the group of people that you meditate with, but that you, that, you know, it becomes your whole class, let's say, you know, in, in like a Marxist focus or, um, you know, is, can the Sangha be Marx's class relations? How, like, how do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So, um, the, the Sangha means the community of Buddhists, right? And in, in earlier Buddhism, uh, this was essentially the monks. Hmm. Um, and the Sangha is important because communities are important. And uh, it's it's very hard to do things on your own. E everything is easier and better if you have people who you respect, who help each other, who develop their ideas. Um, you know, and there's not there's a similar thought in Marxism, namely that the party is important. Hmm. Okay, uh, you, you're not going to achieve much on your own. You need a group of people, of co-workers, to push things forward. So, I mean, both traditions will recognize the importance of a, a group of like-minded people who push the communal endeavor on, as it were. Um, okay, in, in later Buddhism, um, the Buddhist community does get broadened beyond the, the, the monks. And there's a lay community as well. Um, and... So most practicing Buddhists nowadays are not monks. But they belong to this much larger group of like-minded people. Um, and indeed, if you want to help everybody out to get rid of their dukkha, you, and eventually you'll want the Buddhist community to be as broad as it can be. Okay, so in, in the same way, um, in, in Buddhism, uh, sorry, Marxism, uh, you want to improve the society for everybody. So in the end, you want to enlarge the community beyond merely the party um, to everybody. Of course, I mean, th th there are some debates now about the role of the party in Marxism, which many people would be well aware of. Um, but you know, traditional Marxism has always been maybe the party is necessary as a transition measure, but in the end, it should sort of disappear uh, and you get this much more communal uh, society which which runs on um, much more anarchist principles. So, I mean, in a sense, I don't think Marx and Bakunin, for example, were disagreed about what the ultimate society, whatever that might be, is going to be like. They, they were, they certainly disagreed about how you might get there and the role of the party is an important part of that disagreement. Um, but to return to your question, I mean, in, in both 
Buddhist philosophy and Marxist philosophy, the aim essentially is to make life better for everybody. And you might, under some circumstances, need the help of small groups of people who understand things better than others and who are help, can, can help and teach other people. Um, but in the end, it's you're doing this for everybody. Uh, <clears throat> so the uh, another potential contradiction, I think, that is relatively well recognized by people um, is the general uh, difference in terms of materialism and non-materialism. Uh, that you know, Marxism is a a materialist philosophy, right? And sort of dialectical materialism is the name of the game, um, and whereas Buddhism. Uh, there, there has been, I think, a rise, especially as it's as it's moved into the West, of a kind of secular Buddhism that attempts to remove some of the more esoteric, metaphysical aspects of Buddhism and really maintains it as a kind of it can almost be a materialist sort of philosophy. But it hasn't been in most of its tradition. It does. It, it is. It is understood by many people to be a religious you know, or religion itself, um, and it does have a lot of again, esoteric metaphysics um, that I think Marx and and, and, and and many in the sort of Western or analytic or um, certainly modern, postmodern, post-enlightenment would in some ways sort of just roundly reject. Um, and so like the, uh, in, in Laos, the, the uh, Patlet Lao uh, came up with like five different things that they saw as incongruent between between Marxism, um, and one of them is this like spiritual vision of the universe in in Buddhism, as compared to Marx's materialism. Right, Marx rejected religion. You know the famous line about religion being an opium of the people um, and like a flower in the chain. And, and there is a criticism I know of mindfulness generally, but even Buddhism in particular of of being a kind of a sort of, you know, soul of a soulless situation type of um, catharsis, uh, you know, it's just like telling you to accept the world as it is and not focus on changing it, um, or as much at least, you know, maybe changing it around the edges, but not making this kind of deep um, change that Marxism would would strive for. And then there are things like Buddhism is very much about harmony, and, and I think in some ways like calmness, peace, whereas Marxists see a class like class struggle right as the sort of basis of the movement of history all hitherto existing societies are ones of class struggle um and then the role of you know violence obviously buddhism is in general um opposed to violent acts of sort of any kind whereas it does not appear at least historically that marxists have had a huge compunction with using violence when they find it necessary so the sort of materialist versus religious or or you know um spiritual ver vision of the universe in in buddhism and then some of these um you know whether or not it's attachment to suffering instead of class struggle um what how do you see these you know i think in some ways the large cap of the spiritual uh, not uh, spiritual and then materialist but also these kind of independent points we can go one by one too if you <laughs> need to well, look, there are a lot of lot of things there. Um, first of all, what, what does materialism mean in Marx? Well, he called himself a materialist to distance himself from Hegel. Okay? Mm -hmm. so Hegel, um, what drives history is um, Geist, which is kind of the mind of the universe, thinking. And Marx said that this is just mysticism. And what what drives history is people's material conditions. Um, so he has this distinction between the base and the superstructure, um, and he locates the action in in the base. But they, they Marx and Engels always hedge their bets on what the, the determination by the base means. You know, Engels says it's true in the last instance, but doesn't say what that means. And a lot of Marxists have um, thought that the relationship between the base and the superstructure is more dialectical. Gramsci, for example. Uh, and I think that's the right... I, I think the view that it's determination by either the base or the superstructure 
Uh, okay, we're not talk- so we're not talking about guys. We're talking about ideas, what people think, and the relationship between material conditions and what people think is a dialectical one. Um, uh, so I, I think uh, if Marx had been less less um, concerned to distance himself from Hegel, he wouldn't have said that. He'd have said that Hegel got it wrong, but he, he'd have said that the, the, the relationship between material conditions and, and people's thinking is a dialectical one, rather like Gramsci says. Okay. Um, now, there's nothing in that materialist thought that a Buddhist is necessarily going to disagree with. I mean, they want to improve the world, and you've got to improve people's material conditions and, and the way they think. And both go hand in hand in a certain sense. So that that that's not going to be a point of disagreement. Um, uh, one thing. Okay, let's let's go to the other side, the Buddhist side. Um, it's true that in many forms of Buddhism, you get stories about beings that in the West we might think of as superstitious, okay, um, you know, demons and hell, hell realms and deities, which doesn't mean a god, there's no god in Buddhism, but beings who live in a kind of celestial realm and have a really nice life, um, but, they're, they're, uh, but you know, everything comes to an end, and in in Buddhism, whichever realm of existence in, you're going to die and come back um, if you believe in rebirth. And so, so everything changes, e- even for the people who are in a really shitty situation and the people who are in a really good situation, until, you know, it comes from end with enlightenment. Okay, so a lot of that, I think, would, n- would not appeal to Westerners uh, um, because they don't have this kind of tradition. Um, and I don't think Buddhism loses much by jettisoning it. Now, there is one thing which was going to cause disagreement amongst Buddhists in all that, and that is rebirth. So the standard picture in Indian Buddhism and most East Asian Buddhism is that when, when you die, you're going to be reborn uh, until indeed you come to an end with enlightenment. And I think rebirth strikes most Westerners as um, implausible, shall we say. Um, is the view of rebirth necessary to Buddhism? Well, I mean, that that's currently debated, it's particularly amongst Western Buddhists, okay? Um, some Western Buddhists will tell you it is, um, some will tell you it isn't. Um, and so there's this movement in the West that sometimes goes, goes by the name of secular Buddhism, which is Buddhism stripped of all these kind of um, things which are would sort of go against science. Uh, so there is a debate here amongst Buddhists, um, but many Buddhists think that y- you can get rid of all this stuff. Um, and still retain what Buddhism is all about. And, you know, that that's my view. Yeah, it's, it's always seemed strange to me that uh, as much as there is a focus on this kind of no-self, non-self, you have this idea that you can be reborn, which suggests a soul-like nature, right? So there is some kind of core that then does persist into being reborn in some way. And so I, I always found that to be confused i mean it just coming from a very no, sort of the, the, secular this, background the, this is a, a a perennial point of contention especially between buddhists and hindus who think there is a, a self okay um and of course the hindus believe in rebirth too um and they have a much easier time of explaining what it means buddhists have a much more difficult time because there is no self uh, and so there's a lot of Buddhist philosophy which goes into explaining what rebirth means in the context with no self. Uh, okay, let, let, let's not go into that at the moment, at least, because there, there are other things which your general question raised which are really important, um, which we haven't looked at yet. And that is the fact that Buddhism is a religion, 
Mm. How you define religion is really tough. And of course, lots of people have argued that Marxism has many of the features of religion too. Okay, again, let's not go to that there because that's tough. But um, um, f- first important point is that uh, that Buddhism is Buddhism is many things. Okay, it's it's a religion, it's a power structure, it's social organisations, it's an art form, um, and it's a philosophy. Um, and you can be a philosophical Buddhist without being a religious Buddhist. Uh, and I think that people from the West are going to find philosophical Buddhism much more palatable than religious Buddhism. By religious Buddhism, you mean like following sets of practices and some yeah. of the more sort of literate, yeah. liter, uh, literal, is that the right word? Uh, you know, the things that would <laughs> recognize us, that we would you know, recognize from going to church, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah, so I, I think philosophical Buddhism is going to be more attractive than than, than religious Buddhism uh, to many Western Marxists. Um, but there also is something that needs to be thought about, I think, by Buddhists and Marxists about the fact that religion always comes with a power structure. Okay, um, so clearly, if you're in a Buddhist community, there's a power structure involved. Um, of course, in Marxism, or at least the way it's been implemented in the 20th century, there's an enormous power structure involved. Um, and uh, power structures are inherently problematic, at least if you're coming from a Marxist perspective. Okay. So if you're on the kind of anarchist side, rather than the kind of Marxist side of the socialist divide, um, you are going to find... Um, power structures deeply problematic and that's going to be so whether they're you know religious power structures political power structures or for that matter gender power structures or racial power structures um so people from this kind of anarchist wing of the socialist movement are going to find a number of aspects of of buddhist religion problematic I mean, because it does, there's obviously, um, in general, like, the, I think from Hindu slash Buddhist, or I don't know how much of it's in, like, Sikhism, but definitely, like, Hindu Buddhism, there is a whole kind of guru aspect of this. There's the, the sort of teacher for which there's a lot of, like, adulation given, even worship uh, that you could do for, for like, you know, and I think, like you said, as the 20th century shows, secular leader worship can lead mm. to pretty significantly disastrous consequences. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, th- th- there's a difficult issue here for everybody, I think. Look, um, we've already talked about the fact you ain't going to get far on your own. You need to be part of uh, an appropriate group. Groups need organisation. Organisation needs people who will guide, people who are more experienced, more th- who, who, who've been around longer. They know things better. Um, so, so you, you, you need people, um, who can guide groups. Okay. Um, but you don't want people who have the kind of typical problems that go with being in a powerful role. You know, we don't need to go into those much because they're pretty obvious. Um, so even amongst anarchist groups, you have this problem of how you juggle the management of the group without getting the, the downside, the pernicious sides of, of power. Um, okay, and that, that's something that you're going to need to think about whether or not you're a Buddhist or a Marxist or an anarchist or whatever. Uh, so the, I'm curious your thought on the, uh, the divergence of Buddhist focus on sort of harmony, magnanimity, um, uh, equanimity and the Marxist vision of sort of constant class struggle. Um, these seem to be fairly counterposed. How, how would one see these two coming together? Mm. Or do they not? <laughs> do those seem in, inextricably opposed? Um, Yeah, that's an interesting question. 
Um, look, there, there are several aspects of Marxist thought. Um, I think the most important thing in Marxist thought is his analysis of capitalism, which is typically what you get in the sort of later writings. Um, what you're describing there is the view that's usually called historical materialism, which is a view of how society develops and um, the deterministic by the economic base and things like that. Um, I think there are I think personally there are aspects of historical materialism which are a bit problematic. Um, I mean, we've already talked about this distinction between the base and the superstructure. Um, but the attempt to sort of force history into these Procrustean boxes, I think is, it gives you a certain perspective on what happened real history is never going to be as straightforward and as easy as that okay so societies have at times you know fought over sort of social and economic interests of course they have um but then a lot of other things have determined how societies evolved and you know you can look at religion look at how look at marxist thought look at the effect that these have had so History is going to be very complex if you're a thoughtful Marxist, and you're not going to re reduce it to these very simplistic boxes, as it have, has been in some Marxist traditions. Okay, um, And when you understand that society has evolved and is a constant process of change, and the change is brought about by all kinds of things, economic conditions are really important, but there are other things that are important too. Um, I don't think that there is so much there that a, that a Buddhist needs to disagree with. Um, you know, Buddhist theorists haven't talked much about the history of society. You know, the canon evolved in a time when people didn't really understand that society has evolved, and they weren't so concerned with what drives social change on. Okay, now contemporary Buddhists like the Dalai Lama and Tishnah and sure are, because something that we've come to an understanding of in the 19th and 20th century is the social economic evolution of society and that just wasn't obvious to people you know 2000 years ago um so you know contemporary buddhists with their understanding of social change are going to have to take account of some of these things now okay th there's another aspect of the, the sort of class the class nature of society, which you've alluded to, which is important here, which is that the class society is seen as essentially aggro. Okay. Um, and aggro could certainly be seen as a form of dukkha. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, which you want to get rid of. Well, okay. Um, if class interests do get aggro, then it's, it's a form of dukkha, you want to get rid of them. There's going to be no disagreement there on the Buddhist part. But um, there's a question of how much you should sort of use this aggro to change society. And, you know, some Marxists have thought that it's going to be necessary at some stage. This may lead to violence. Um... Now, first of all, is it better to get rid of the aggro without violence if it's possible? Well, yeah, I think so. And I think even most Marxists would think that. Violence breeds more violence. We know that. Um, is it going to be a necessary evil sometimes? Well, maybe. Okay. Um, Buddhism, unlike Jainism, is not a pacifist view. You know, there, there, there are texts, uh, Buddhist texts, where, for example, the Buddha in an earlier life killed people because although that's not a great thing to do it was what was necessary in the context so there's a Jataka tale where the Buddha is a um, a ship's captain and he understands that one of the passengers is aiming to kill and rob all the other people and in this context there's no other way nothing, no way of stopping this but killing this person and the Buddha does it 
Um, so e even in Buddhism, there, there's a thought that violence may be necessary sometimes. Of course, it's, well, violence is a shit thing, and it's people suffer. People suffer badly in revolutions, mm -hmm. okay? Violent revolutions, I'm talking about. Okay, so if you can get by without it, it's better, but sometimes it may just be necessary. And I think you will find that's a view of both Marxism and Buddhism. Yeah, so like I think there's the, always two things I want to mention. One, um, yeah, I too have had, uh, especially as of late, um, re reviewing, I will say I didn't read in super detail, um, the you know recent book, the, the Dawn of Everything, by David Graeber and David Wengro, where they talk about, you know, I think in some ways really not specifically going against sort of Marx's historical materialism, but this generally kind of accepted mode of anthropological framing of like the evolution of human societies um, and, and have shown that there's just such a divergence that, you know, these, these like quite, even when I was reading them at the first time, sort of these major claims that Marx and Engels made about Marx being a kind of Darwin of, of you know, it's human human like history or something that that you that Marx had found the law of human history and how it develops always seemed to me to be way way overstating um, what Marx had done uh, and and whether and I, and there's I think significant questions as to whether or not that's even possible that if, if there is some kind of law of history and then and there's also obviously like some pernicious aspects of saying so because that that leads you to you know adopting rigid i would say kind of appreciations or or perspectives that that don't allow for i think what the benefit of let's say dialectical materialism or even the dialectical approach generally allows which is this understanding that like as new things come, as new information comes, as new awareness comes, being able to like reshape and re-understand how you see things, uh, so that it fits with the sort of facts and and, and evidence that we're able to produce, uh, is more important than sticking to the line. And that you know you can stick to the line in a way that causes you to just wildly, I mean, it, at minimum misunderstand what's going on, and at maximum engage in totally unjustified you know potentially genocidal kinds of campaigns and so uh, you know i think that that's you know and to the degree that there is even the um tendency to do so it, it should be kind of pulled against and 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 i think that we ought to re-understand marx as not claiming what he had claimed to do which is to find the laws of history or historical development but that there is a perspective in which he gave as a, essentially a sort of left Hegelian that is conti that continues to be to be useful, and I think in some ways I feel the same way about the the certain members of the Buddhist community, is certain teachers and things like that, who will very much have a gospel like appreciation of of um, the the sayings of Buddha and some of those things, and not see it as this kind of general perspective that allow that can be compatible with the scientific advancements or something, but that are kind of set in stone and and unmovable. And I just think that none, well, that, neither of that's helpful. That, that's absolutely right. I mean, in, in all movements, you're going to get a, did you call it a hero worship, um, <laughs> where you know um, you look at the founder, however, and you say, well, they got it absolutely right. And you deviate from that at your peril. Okay, look, um, the Buddha and Marx were very clever people. They had enormous points of insight, and there's an enormous amount to be learned from their thought. Okay, but both Marxism and Buddhism are living traditions. Both have evolved considerably since their founders. And not only have they evolved, but we... There's a lot that we understand about the world now that they did not. And it's not because we're smarter. It's just that science has taken us a long way. Um, we know a lot better how the environment works now than the Buddha did. We know much more about the social economic evolution of societies than the Buddha did. Um, we, we know, again, much more about uh, the environment than Marx did. 
Um, and we certainly know a lot more about um, the dangers of various kinds of political action than Marx did. I mean, what Marx would have made of events in the 20th century had he come back to find out about them? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. But uh, uh, certainly he would have modified his ideas. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that neither Marx or the Buddha would have been dogmatists in the sense that they thought that they find, found the final and ultimate truth about everything. Um, so uh, they, they, I'm sure, would have endorsed the fact that uh, as we learn more about the world in which we live, uh, then some points of insight have to be fine-tuned, um, new points of insight have to be added, uh, maybe even some points that we thought were right have to be jettisoned. Um, that's a function of just learning more as time goes on. Um, and of course that behoves a certain humility in all of us. Um, so I think this sort of hero, hero worship attitude is in the end going to be counterproductive because it, it again says the things that we learn just as we've been around longer to find things out. Yeah, <clears throat> the biggest warning of, I think, of all religions and of all political history has been um, be very like um, be very weary of the dogmatic uh, cults of personality. Because those are the most dangerous uh, things that you know, whether it's religious or not, they they uh, you know will deny the truth when it isn't useful for their particular perspective, and uh, will do whatever it takes to maintain their position of power and authority. And it's uh, it's the most dangerous, which which in some ways leads me to my last kind of thing, because it it I got the impression uh, and. You know, you let me know if you're wrong. I mean, my introduction to even sort of radical philosophy and or um, <clears throat> I mean, sort of political thinking, at least, sort of started essentially with Noam Chomsky. Um, and so there was a sort of, I have a very deep anti-authoritarian streak. And so for me, um, finding Bakunin and Kropotkin and a few other um, uh people w spoke to me. It was the, the anarchist tradition was something that I was, it was my like first sort of foray into philosophy generally and politics, you know. Um, I then diverted from that and really d dove deep into Marxism and, and for a very long time, you know, was a, was almost, dare I say, a kind of dogmatic Marxist in some ways. Um, as I think I've grown older and stuff like that, I have maybe the pendulum or the dialectic or whatever you want to call it has kind of swung back much more into an interest in anarchism, um, sort of taking the, the, in the, the useful developments that Mark and, you know, useful things that Mark said specifically, like you said, as his critique of capitalism is understanding how the system works, the political economy aspect of it. Um, but swaying more towards the, um, the anarchist, uh, even sort of political and social program. I, the other podcast I do is an all things co-op podcast talking about worker cooperatives and, and, uh, and the really important role that they could play as providing, as opposed to the wholesale negative, we need to tear down capitalism and whatever we replace it with will be up to the people at that time. Uh, and instead say, no, here's, here's an example of what it means to like have the workers own the means of production in a democratic way that can have all these important possibilities. And so I have, in some ways, gone back to my anarchist roots. Um, and I got the impression that, that if, if you had to like, you know, put your money down on the anarchist or Marxist sort of tradition, that would be more on the anarchist that you, that when you're talking about the kind of the role of the state and its institutions, you did kind of talk about the difference between Marxist and anarchist traditions. Um, and so one, uh, am I right? And two, um, bringing in the Buddhist aspect of that, um, how does, what's the relationship with Buddhism to the idea of the state? I mean, I know that we, there's, there's obviously examples of, different traditions with different leaders that have uh, even kind of clashed and had a schism type of relationship, not dissimilar to different socialist groups. Um, the, the Buddha was himself, at least before he left, a, a prince, so it had understood the role of 
statecraft, let's say. Um, and then we do have this example of Tibet, which is a state and was at least prior to occupation that was essentially like a Buddhist theocracy. And so, um, so the two parts of that question are, um, how do you view the state? And, you know, does that represent a more anarchist view than a Marxist view? And what does Buddhism have to say about the role of the state and of those kind of power, those earthly power structures, let's say? Yes. No, that's an interesting question. Look, first of all, um, uh, socialism has always had these two wings, uh, Marxism and, and anarchism, uh, and they have a great deal in common. Like you said, the, end, the ends is, is the same. In many ways, it's the means. The, the end is the same, um, but also their understanding of what's wrong with society is very similar. Okay, So um, there's nothing that an anarchist need disagree with about Marx's analysis of capital. And in fact, you know, if you listen to Chomsky talking, uh, then everything I've heard him say and read of his suggests that he, he thinks that... His, I mean, his understanding of the nature of capitalism its exploitation, its ideology, and so on, is uh, completely Marxist. Okay. So the thing which separated Buddhist, uh, Marxists and, and anarchists was simply um, whether you need a power structure um, to change society, a, a top-down power structure to change society, to get it from where it is to where it ought to be. Um, and the Marxist answer was yes, and the anarchist answer was no. In fact, if you construct a power structure, you won't get there precisely because once you have a power structure, then it never dismantles itself and it starts to run whatever it's running for its own benefit. And I mean, how many times have we seen that uh, in human history in the last? you know, century, um, for all kinds of reasons. And I think the anarchists got it dead right. Um, it makes changing for an anarchist much more difficult because changing without a power structure is really hard because you need organisation. And organisations without a power structure are difficult to, you know, manage. So it, if you're an anarchist, it makes thinking about change or achieving change much much harder I think but the thought remains that if you try and do it with the power structure a top down power structure you're not going to get where you want anyway so you might as well face the problem you know face up to it because um, it's the only way you're going to make things better okay so that's the answer to the first question second question is where does Buddhism sit with all of this Well, look, at least until the last century, Buddhism has not had to deal with modern industrial societies. So Buddhism has largely been about societies that were monarchies, or at least certainly agricultural communities. Um, so they're dealing with a very different kind of beast from modern industrial society. So uh, you don't find discussions of how the state should run um, except in these agricultural communities. And kind of that kind of thinking is now, you know, obsolete because we ain't going back to that short of some global catastrophe, which is unfortunately not <laughs> at all impossible. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, to be interesting, you've got to talk about how the sort of basic understanding of Buddhist principles affect the kind of society in which we live. Um, and you've only seen Buddhist philosophers really addressing that question in the last hundred years or so because of um, the fact that Buddhists have only had to, you know, only lived in this kind of society for, say, a hundred years. Um, and then you get kind of um, people like Thich Nhat Han and the Dalai Lama who say they're, that they're Marx. Well, the Dalai Lama says he's Marxist. Um, I don't think he would endorse 
the kind of top-down power structure that you get in um, places where Marxist Marxism had, has at least been invoked, Soviet Union, China, and so on. I, I don't think he's very keen on these top-down power structures. So uh, there are at least some contemporary Buddhists who I suspect will be more inclined to anarchism than, than uh, traditional Marxism or what it was made in the 20th century. Um, but I think it's fair to say that that has to be some kind of ongoing debate just because no one has an idea of, has a detailed idea of how we move society into a better direction. We know a lot of what's wrong with it, but how we get to a better position is still a, you know, very much a work in progress and is going to remain like that as we learn more about the world in which we live and how the bits fit together and so on. Yeah, in some ways we have a lot of, you could say we have a lot of examples of what not to do. You know, obviously Marx uh, and, and Engels to a certain degree, like a lot of talk about the, the current power structures, maybe how they developed, what is sort of wrong with them. But a, a an intention, I think, coming from Hegel in some ways um, of not predicting the future, not wanting to kind of, you know, say, oh, this is what it's going to look like. And you get just like a few little nuggets, you know, here and there about the free association of labor and, um, you know, being a being able to, what is it, like fish and uh, labor and criticize without being a fisherman, a laborer or, or a critic, you know, some of these kinds of things. But there are not a lot of like roadways. And then for the people who do have in some ways some a more revolutionary programs, you know, like Lenin, um, one, they're either highly historically constrained to, you know, czarist Russia, or their um, consequences are fairly dire. Um, and so, yeah, there is, uh, especially for those, I think, in the certainly the sort of Anglo sphere um, who have potentially longer traditions of republicanism, sort of small art republicanism, um, the, the sort of revolutionary path that avoids some of the dire consequences that we've seen in revolutionary upheavals say, going back to the English Civil War, um, it is not, it just doesn't seem to be either in vogue or something that a lot of people want to touch or have really uh, theorized in, in, in some sort of deep way. Um, and so there is, to me, at least a kind of gap or a deficit there in terms of, um, you got a lot of people who talk about what's wrong, uh, but not a lot of people that talk about how you could get beyond it. Um, and, you know, I have a few ideas. I have expressed those in some ways on the podcast and stuff like that, but um, it doesn't seem to be of a huge amount of interest. And I think to our to our detriment, because I think there is many people who just look at, particularly in, in the U.S., and just sort of have a kind of nihilistic approach or, or even a, just a sort of pessimistic maybe of just like, well, I don't really see how things do change. Um, and I think that that um, is something that ought to be corrected. I think we have a relatively well-established notion of what's wrong, and we don't need to work so much on that. And what we need now are some proposals in terms of what we should do. Um, and I do think, be curious in some ways as a professional intellectual, for lack of a better term, um, there does seem to be, you know, Marx is famous thesis on Feuerbach that the philosophers have hitherto only, you know, sought to understand the world. The point is to change it. Um, it does seem like that academia, um, the, the things that they want to change, I would say, are potentially, I don't want to call them super fringe, but more on the outside or maybe even on, let's say, the, the superstructure rather than the base. Um, and it seems to me that though laudable efforts at making a kind of social progress, they do not sufficiently help uh, those the, the process of social change. Uh, and so you get a lot of trying to understand the world and maybe making some, you know, kind of movement here and there, but there's no major project coming out of the, out of academia for. I, I think that's change. true. 
Uh, I mean, there, there are Marxist theoreticians in the universities, even in the United States, let alone Europe. Um, they're not often political activists. Uh, I think it's much more common for people who are interested in kind of oppressions caused by gender and race to be politically active than it is for people who are interested in oppression caused by class to be politically active. Um, and that hopefully should change. Why do you think that is? I, I agree with you. I just I don't know why. Don't want to get kicked um, out. It's it's, it's easier it's easier to do the racial and and sex based discrimination and, and oppression than it is the class because it's more of a threat. You could still fit in a kind of less gender and the, racially discriminatory system within the confines of the capitalist mode this of production. Maybe a feature of the time in which we live, um, but I think we have a much clearer idea of what it will be to live in a society without gender oppression and racial oppression than it is to think what a society would be like without economic oppression. Hmm. Uh, it's not to say it's easy to achieve, but, you know, um, a society without gender and racial oppression is a society where people's gender and race really is irrelevant to what happens in terms of their education, their employment, um, their political status, etc., etc., uh, we really don't have a clear idea of what a post-capitalist society is like. Um, and the important question is um, how to get there. The, um, the, the book that I wrote that you mentioned so kindly, I wanted to call it The Point How is to Change It. <laughs> the publisher said no one's going to understand that, or at least no one who doesn't know much is going to understand it. So we, we changed the title. But, the, the, I mean, the, the point is to change it. That's where we should be thinking about. And that's... We don't... Look, constructing a utopian society is just that. It's crazy. We're never going to get to a utopia, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we can make society better, sure. And the people who think you can't change society are just crazy. <laughs> Just just read some history, okay? Um, the thought that we're going to have a capitalist system in the year 3000 is as implausible as the thought that we, to, you know, nothing would change between the feudal society of 1000 and 2000. That's, that's just like, so we, we can change. The only question is how we're going to change and how we change for the better. And that's a million dollar question. Um, And I think we're going to have to be somewhat experimental about this because we don't know what's going to work. We don't understand the society we live in very well. We know the things we want to get rid of, or at least I know a lot of the things I want to get rid of. Uh, how best to bring that about? Well, we should try things and see what works. And if it doesn't, try something else and learn from our mistakes and learn from the things that work. Um, and I, actually, I think that's very similar to Chomsky's view from what I hear him say. Um, so uh, it's it's just crazy thinking. Here's the utopia, right? And now let's have a revolution and bring that about. But that ain't going to happen. Right, yeah. I completely, completely agree with that. Um, so, all right, well... Um, one, yeah, I mean, I'll, I, in some ways I'll do a, a sort of last plug of the the book, uh, Capitalism, Its Nature and Replacement, Buddhist and Marxist Insights, better better titled, The Point is to Change It, but alas, <laughs> publishers are what they are. Um, but I, I really, I, I pretty, like I said, uh, it, I've taken a, a several month hiatus from um, doing this podcast uh, and sort of given my two cents in the sort of modern way of doing it. Um, and uh, partially to do a deep dive into Buddhism and have, have genuinely, um, definitely a sort of secular Buddhist. And what I would even say, I mean, I, I, if I had to give myself lab you know, labels, it would be a kind of 
anarcho-Marxist Buddhist Stoic, <laughs> uh, um, which you know allows me to uh, try to genuinely live up to that serenity prayer that comes from uh, you know a Stoic position of accepting things that can't change and change things that can't accept, and um, learning to accept that the world is what it is right now, but it would it it, it is not fixed. There is a significant amount of uh, impermanence of this sort of system, and that uh, to focus on the things that we can do to to make that change. I think um, reading your book and talking to you about it uh, has really helped me, and, and was in many ways a kind of like, all right, um, if I if I do if I do want to um, push against some of the feelings of alienation and actually decrease suffering. I need to not pull back from the world, you know, and just and do the whole do the the sort of stereotypical Buddhist ascetic thing and just stop caring about the outside world, but to have that dialectical or or uh, proactive relationship with the rest of the world. And at this point, um, not being in a you know revolutionary moment, the point is to learn, understand, communicate, and uh, have important conversations. To help myself learn, but to help other people who might be uh, interested in doing so, and I think that talking to you about this particular issue uh, is a great way to kind of get back into the game. So I I am significant. I, I thank you deeply, <laughs> and uh, in some ways, uh, I'm in your debt for for prompting me to come back into the into the good fight, as it were. Well, I mean, thank you for the, your kind words. Uh, I think. Probably our views are, are very similar in many ways. Uh, you know, if we, if probably if we explore issues further, we disagree about a number of things. But that, you know, that we're, we're human, so you expect that. But I, I rather suspect that we we tend to come at things from the same sort of perspective. Um, and you know, what, whatever we can do to help people to you know, join us in our perspective um, is great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I uh, agree with that. And like I said, thanks uh, again for coming on and uh, I look forward to you know other things that you're doing and potentially having c- conversations down the road. I look forward to it too, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Sensible Socialist Podcast. This podcast is supported by listeners like you no advertisements or anything will ever be said. If you want to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash sensible socialist and give today. Also, please give us a review or a rating on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast as it greatly helps. All right. See you next time.